Um, it's now my pleasure to open the second session and to introduce uh, um, an internationally recognized uh, scientist and colleague, Dr. Uh, Akiko Iwasaki, who will give a keynote lecture um, shortly. So um, Dr. Iwasaki is uh, the Waldemar von Zedwich Professor of Immunobiology and Molecular Cellular and Development Biology at uh, Yale University and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, delighted to say that she received her PhD at uh, University of Toronto and um, in Canada and did her postdoctoral training at the NIH. She's had numerous awards and recognition of the excellent science she does. She's elected to the American Association of Immunobiologists Council, to the National Academy of Scientists, uh, Sciences, to the National Academy of Medicine, to the American Academy of Microbiology, the European Molecular Biological uh, Organization, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, what she's going to talk to us about today uh, is a focus uh, of her last couple of years uh, in the context of COVID. Um, certainly, Dr. Irosaki is renowned for her work on innate and adaptive immunity to a variety of viruses, such as herpes and Zika that she's done in the past. But most recently, as I said, she's focused on COVID, um, showing that delayed, for example, delayed production of neutralizing antibodies um, correlates with fatal COVID-19. She's shown neuroinvasion of SARS-CoV-2 in human brains. Um, she's looked at the, what she's called the immunological misfiring in severe COVID-19 and also sex differences in immune responses to infection. Um, so really uh, a very um, comprehensive study of COVID-19 and added to all of that, she's found the time to be an excellent communicator um, to relay all this information to the lay public and really communicate effectively about COVID-19. But I don't want to spend any more time, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Iwasaki and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fish. Um, it's really my pleasure to be on this panel today. And um, I do uh, fondly uh, reflect on my time in Toronto. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, let me share my screen. OK. So um, what I'd like to talk about today is, as Dr. Fish mentioned, uh, our uh, work on immune responses to SARS-CoV-2. However, this is beyond science's initiative, and I just wanted to mention um, that uh, scientists are a part of the world fabric, and uh, we are... Um, you know, very upset, and uh, we stand with what's going on with, with the Ukraine, Ukraine and what's going on in, in that part of the world right now. Um, it is difficult to kind of focus on science when uh, things are happening. And I just wanted to say that we stand with Ukraine. Okay. So um, if you look at the cases of um, COVID-19 uh, as of a couple of days ago. This is a figure taken from the Johns Hopkins um, Center for System Science and Engineering. We see that uh, there's about 430 million cases worldwide with uh, about 6 million deaths. And these are um, likely uh, under reporting because there are very uh, difficult to um, uh, statistically accumulate these numbers in some parts of the world. Um, and, and you can see that there are um, lots of uh, differences among the, the world regions on, on the intensity of uh, cases and uh, deaths that are happening. And uh, this is also um, very important to mention that despite this global pandemic, we are still not having the uh, global distribution of vaccines, um, and in particular, there are regions that are well covered by, uh, this is looking at single dose, but if you, if you look at the fully vaccinated, the disparities are more, um, more severe. So if you can see that there are regions of the world that still need vaccines, um, and it's not just about distributing the vaccines, there are infrastructures that are needed to administer the vaccines in various countries, which may or may not be possible at this time. So th this is 
in order to really combat this global pandemic, we really need to be dealing with issues of global um, equity in distribution and delivery of these vaccines. So I'm going to touch on one uh, potential um, solution to uh, such uh, unequal distribution and, and, and um, the, the ease with which the vaccine may be distributed. Um, so uh, as Dr. Fish mentioned, we've been studying COVID-19 for the past two years. Um, and essentially what we're learning is that there is a lot of um, interpersonal variations in COVID-19 disease outcomes. For instance, uh, we see uh, many people getting asymptomatic infection and while others suffer from fatal diseases, we also have acute COVID diseases and those who recover from it and those who don't and develop long, long haul disease. And this variation, of course, has a lot to do with the host. Um, and we've been looking at what's different about the host immune system in moderate severe to fatal cases of COVID-19 and have seen uh, distinct differences that I'm going to talk about today, uh, as well as sort of looking at the distribution of the virus within the body uh, and showing that saliva viral load is a much better correlate of disease severity than the nasopharyngeal viral load. We've also been looking at sex differences in immune response to COVID and demonstrated that uh, during the early phase of the infection, women tend to mount um, better T cell immunity and men, especially older men uh, who fail to do so, uh, go on to develop worse disease outcomes. We've also been studying um, patients who are uh, pregnant and infected with SARS-CoV-2 and have seen uh, in one case of severe uh, pregnancy um, and related infection in the placenta that uh, unfortunately led to the loss of the fetus. Uh, in other cases of respiratory um, um, COVID, we have seen that even though the the mothers are infected um, in the respiratory tract and there is no um, infection of the placenta. Nevertheless, there is transcriptome differences in the placenta that suggest distal um, regulation of the immune responses. And there's uh, currently, we're really working hard to try to understand what long COVID uh, is caused by and how we can help uh, develop better therapies. And this is a, a very nice uh, um, graphics uh, demonstration of how long COVID exhausts the body by Josh Keller in the New York Times. And it really illustrates the multi-organ involvement nature of long COVID. Uh, in particular, there is the involvement of the brain um, as uh, cognitive issues, as well as uh, obviously the lungs and circulatory system and the immune system. And so long COVID really requires significant investment in research, treatment, care, and social and financial support for the patients. And I don't think we're anywhere close to what we really need to be uh, doing to help um, with this uh, sort of second uh, parallel pandemic that's going on. I I'm not going to be talking about the research in this area today, but I just wanted to mention that this is a big problem. So what I'd like to do today um, in, in the next um, uh, few minutes is to kind of talk about how do uh, long, longitudinal immune responses in the hospital like patients differ according to disease outcomes. What does the immune signature tell us about the disease process itself? And um, I'm also gonna talk about um, a preprint work that we have uh, where we are developing um, transmission blocking vaccines through the nasal uh, nasal mucosal um, barrier. So the first uh, talk about the um, patient's immune responses, uh, we were um, enabled to do so by the creation of Impact Yale Repository, which was uh, done so uh, by Professor Albert Coe and others um, along with my, my team uh, to collect samples from patients every three days. Um, and these samples included blood, saliva, MP, oral swabs, uh, feces, and urine. And using these uh, samples, we were able to uh, understand immune responses that are happening in real time in the patients. And the second cohort of patients are, have, have milder disease. And uh, from that cohort, we are also able to collect specimens uh, as well as symptoms. 
And then the third cohort um, is a, a healthcare worker cohort uh, who provided a valuable um, negative control or healthy control. And we also provided um, uh, daily uh, NP and saliva viral testing. And recall in, in early uh, 2020, we had very limited testing available. And so this provided um, an invaluable source of testing for the healthcare workers um, in the Yale New Haven community. So using the uh, samples that we collected from the hospitalized patients, uh, we launched our, our investigation on longitudinal immune phenotyping. This was led by four brilliant trainees John Klein, Patrick Wong, Carolina Lucas, and Tiago Castro, with numerous other um, collaborators, of course. So this study uh, was designed to monitor immune responses over time in the hospitalized patients. And we assigned six different clinical scores for the patients, depending on uh, the status of their clinical care. For instance, uh, we had clinical scores one, two, and three for hosp hospitalized patients who are not in the ICU, who require different levels of um, supplemental oxygen. And four, five, and six are uh, assigned to patients who had, uh, were in the ICU uh, with mechanical ventilation and also death, number six. And zero uh, represents the SARS-CoV-2 negative healthcare workers. Uh, one of the, the key findings from the flow cytometry analysis is that unlike the uh, healthy PBMC, which usually you see a composition of large uh, percentage of T cells, V cells, and K cells, and um, other myeloid cells, in the COVID patients, we saw a significant decline in the uh, T cell, uh, which was already been reported by our colleagues in China, um, as well as the sort of increase in inflammatory monocytes and inclusion of low density granulocytes such as neutrophils and eosinophils that are normally not found in the healthy PBMC. We noticed that the, one of the distinguishing factors for patients with severe versus moderate COVID is that the viral load in the nasopharynx is maintained in severe patients. Uh, you see in the pink here over time. So the x-axis here is days from symptom onset and the y-axis is the nasopharyngeal viral load in the logarithmic scale. And you see that the severe patients actually, if anything, it's, it's uh, elevating their viral load um, even up to 20 days post-symptom onset, whereas the moderate patients, they're able to reduce the viral load over time. And um, ironically, these antiviral interferons that are supposed to control the virus, such as the interferon alpha and gamma, are elevated as a result of increasing viral load. So uh, here is the x-axis, this is the viral load, y-axis is these uh, cytokines, and you see that there's a positive correlation, uh, suggesting that the viral load is driving these antiviral cytokines and not, not the other way around. Um, and the, it, it, it indicates that this virus is able to evade interferon-dependent antiviral um, immune mechanisms. And of course, other cytokines such as TNF and TRAIL were also being elevated um, in, as a result of increasing viral load. And so if you look at the um, other cell types and cytokines that are found in these patients, um, and, and I've divided them into three categories, the type one immune response that's uh, normally engaged during a viral infection, type two immune response that we consider uh, more for anti-parasite and allergic responses, and type three responses that are sort of against the extracellular pathogens, uh, fungi and bacteria. And what you notice is that the severe patients have increasing levels of these factors and cell types over the course of disease, whereas the moderate patients have either uh, flatline or declining levels of these um, factors over time. Um, and, and what was striking to us is the um, observations that the type 2 immune responses, such as increase in the eosinophils and IgE, as well as numerous um, type 2 cytokines are elevating in the long COVID patients. 
this is quite unusual to see in a, in a viral infection. And, and um, we also saw these um, anti um, uh, sort of TH17 type of response also being elevated. So this is a slide that I usually use to describe uh, how well the immune system is coordinated against different pathogens to uh, my medical students um, that I teach. And what I normally say is that the dendritic cells that acquire pathogen uh, present the peptide and IFT cells and through secretion of first order cytokines can educate the T cell into different subsets uh, Th2 for anti-parasite response, Th1 for antiviral, Th17 for antifungal, and so on. Um, and these effector cytokines that are released by the lymphocytes, the second order cytokines are important uh, to engage different effector functions to clear these different types of pathogens. However, in the case of severe COVID, we're seeing all of these things engaged at once. And when we look for the biomarker for COVID-19 mortality, what we found was the top biomarker for mortality turned out to be IL-18, which is a cytokine that's released downstream of inflammasome activation, followed by the uh, interferon alpha, the antiviral cytokine that I mentioned earlier, and IL-10 and uh, neutrophils and other things. So this paints a picture of a um, inflammasome dependent pathology um, as well as this sort of um, elevated levels of interferon at late stage of infection being maladaptive to uh, fighting this uh, infection. And in fact, it is, is contributing to the pathology itself. And so what about the timing of these adaptive immune responses in these patients? Uh, so we, we studied this neutralizing antibody production uh, in, in the same set of patients, and uh, this study was led by Carolina Lucas and John Klein, uh, along with many other investigators. And here what we found was that um, when we compared either IgM or, or IgG against the spike or the receptor binding domain of the spike, um, what you see is that, uh, so this is negative control in the, uh, the dark um, circles here. And then there's the non-hospitalized mild COVID patients who develop um, good levels, but not very high. Some of them actually don't develop very um, detectable levels of anti-spike IgG. And then you see that the moderate disease patients, uh, the one, two, and three, um, uh, they, they do develop um, variable levels of antibodies, but in fact, the severe disease patients had the highest level of antibody against the spike protein. And the disease patients, it's not that they failed to develop antibodies, but uh, they had variable levels of antibody to the spike and RBD. And so uh, this kind of puzzled us um, as to why these patients are still dying if they're developing neutralizing anti uh, the antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. So it turns out that the time course of uh, immune response is, is critical for um, defending against this infection and disease. And so this, if you look at the IgG response to the spike or the RBD here, and a look at the purple line, which is the patients who um, had fatal disease, you see that their ability to mount anti-spike yeah. antibody is quite yeah. delayed. Um, it's something like 20 to 25 days of symptom onset, they still have low levels and it's only at the very end that they are able to mount uh, robust um, anti-spike antibodies compared to patients who are discharged alive that are in the green uh, lines, you can see here that they develop uh, quickly antibody responses uh, within uh, uh, the first couple of weeks. Um, and then there are also um, a few patients that we call high neutralizer or, or HN on the red line here. They had very high levels of um, antibody to the RBD and the spike to begin with. Um, and then they were able to maintain high levels and, and, and they did well with the disease. Um, so interestingly, these types of time course, as well as the absolute levels of antibodies, depending on when that's engaged, appears to control um, disease outcome. So to, to illustrate this point, what we did was uh, we divided the patients into those who had 
develop neutralizing antibody prior to 14 days of symptom onset, the early neutralizers in pink, versus those who develop the antibody, but later after the 14 days of symptom onset. And we follow the disease course over time in these patients. And what you see is that the early neutralizers in pink are able to eventually reduce the clinical score and recover from disease. Whereas those who had late neutralizer um, antibodies um, diverged around the fourth collection time period, and they developed worse disease, um, and many of them actually, unfortunately, uh, had fatal disease. So this illustrated that uh, persistent viral load is detected from severe disease patients and in, in lethal COVID. And this viral load appears to be driving the antiviral cytokine and inflammatory cytokine responses, which turned out to be the biomarker for mortality in these patients. Um, and the increases in the interferon and the, uh, some of the inflammatory cytokines like the IL-18 are predictive of mortality. And in patients who develop worst uh, diseases had the combination of type one, two, and three cytokines uh, being elevated over time. And we believe this is a maladaptive immune response to viral infection. And the time course, but not the absolute antibody levels um, of antibody responses correspond to disease outcome. So as I mentioned, the delayed onset of neutralizing antibodies was uh, found in the uh, people with lethal COVID. So this paints a picture that the timing of immune response is critical for recovering from this infection. And that uh, similar um, uh, type of um, uh, principle may apply for developing acute versus long COVID. And that's what's something we're investigating currently. Um, and so in the remaining uh, few minutes, what I like to do is to talk about our ongoing work on, on developing vaccines that can block infections and transmission. So the issue that we're dealing with currently um, is that even though we have amazing vaccines that can prevent severe disease and uh, hospitalization and death, uh, the, there is some extent uh, waning of the antibody responses, as well as uh, more limited reduction in the T cell and B cell memory over time. Um, and current immune responses elicited by the intramuscular vaccines elicit very strong systemic immune responses, but these uh, vaccines were not designed to elicit mucosal immunity, and we have very limited access of antibodies and T cells to the nasal cavity and the um, uh, respiratory mucosa. Uh, there is definitely some um, access of the IgG, but very limited IgA responses um, as shown by uh, John Gomerman and others. And so um, there is also the accompaniment of the emergence of new variants that are more immune evasive and that are more transmissible, uh, raising the bar for um, vaccine um, every time these uh, um, emergence of the VOCs occur. So how do we um, deal with these um, challenges of having these new variants coming in and uh, potentially different uh, spike protein mutations every time? Um, and the waning immunity and uh, inability to now control infection with the existing vaccines. Um, so we think the answer lies in mucosal immunity. Mucosal immunity, uh, this is something we've been studying um, over the last 20 years, uh, is the uh, ability of uh, existing mechanisms that enable antibodies to be secreted into the mucus layer, such as the secretory IgA, which is the dimeric IgA that is being transported by the um, polymeric IgA receptor across the epithelium as well as IgG that can be transported across the epithelia. Um, and, and this presence of these types of antiviral antibodies in the mucus layer uh, provides a robust and potentially even sterilizing protection against uh, incoming virus. But even if that's not possible, we can establish tissue resident memory cells of T cells and B cells to be quickly re-stimulated upon exposure and that will eliminate infected cells very quickly within the mucosal tissue before it spreads to other organs. So um, what are the possible problems and how do we solve these? 
Well, if you look at the uh, landscape of uh, uh, licensed vaccines, only a handful uh, are mucosal vaccines. And most mucosal vaccines are uh, live attenuated vaccines, which require significant uh, research and development for safety and are not useful in uh, immunocompromised people. There's only one available um, mucosal vaccine, which is flu mist for uh, respiratory pathogens. And flu mist is approved for um, those who are two to 49 years of age, uh, but not for pregnant women and not for immunocompromised uh, due to uh, adverse events that could happen with flu mist. And vector vaccines um, are being developed, um, but cannot be used repeatedly due to anti-vector immune responses that uh, emerge. So, and, uh, so how do we deal with these um, issues and how do we make safe, cheap and effective vaccines mucosally? And we came up with a solution called Prime and Spike, which is to uh, safely and robustly induce uh, mucosal immunity uh, with using a nasal booster strategy. So this relies on some sort of pre-existing immune responses elicited either by vaccination or um, prior infection redirecting that immune response to the nasal cavity using a second approach. Um, so the approach is very simple. Uh, we first prime the host uh, with um, mRNA LMP. This is a Pfizer vaccine we used in mice to elicit uh, circulating immune responses, memory responses. And then we come in with a second step, uh, mucosal spike, which is essentially just recombinant spike protein in saline sprayed into the nose of the mouse. mouse. And, and what we can see is that there is a redirection of um, cells and um, antibodies that are induced within the respiratory mucosa that enable establishment of mucosal immunity. And I'll show you some evidence for that. Um, this is just to uh, show you the schematics of what we do. We take the uh, K18 human ACE2, which is the... Um, animals that are transgenic for human ACE2 that can be infected with SARS-CoV-2. So we first prime these animals using the mRNA LMP, this is the Pfizer vaccine, and then 14 days later we come in with mucosal booster, uh, one microgram of SARS-CoV-2 spike intranasally, and then we measure uh, the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid. And what we see is that there's a striking increase in the uh, anti spike one uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA in the bowel fluid in the animals that received prime and spike in the blue dots here. Those who are naive obviously have nothing. IM prime alone creates no IgA and IN spike alone creates no IgA because there is no adjuvant there. So the ability of the prime and spike to elicit IgA really rests on the fact that there is existing uh, memory T cells that we're using as a natural adjuvant to prime the secondary immune response. And similar um, um, IgG increases are seen in the prime and spike. We can also use the uh, same strategy to elicit um, antigen-specific CD8 T cell responses in the lung parenchyma, within the um, bronchial alveolar lavage fluid, and in the nasal cavity. So the prime and spike elicits both the antibody response as well as tissue resident memory T cells. And we can also use this strategy to protect the animal from lethal SARS-CoV-2 challenge. You see here, the blue line indicates the prime and spike animal that are challenged with lethal dose of SARS-CoV-2, and none of them lose any weight, and all of them survive the infection compared to the prime alone group. And more importantly, this strategy allows us to uh, considerably reduce viral titers in the lung and the nasal turbinate, and uh, virtually no pathology is seen after challenge uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the prime and spike animals. And this picture um, illustrates that point that in the prime and spike animals on the right columns, the lung looks very, the lungs look very uh, clean, just like in the uninfected animal, whereas in the uh, IM prime alone uh, animals that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 obviously develops um, of lots of inflammatory um, infiltrates as well as damage to the lung tissue. So what we are able to accomplish is uh, 
basically by leveraging the existing immune responses, uh, circulating immune response, we can redirect that and create nasal and respiratory immunity that um, basically elicits uh, IgA, secretory IgA, IgG, as well as uh, tissue resident memory B and T cells. And by using a different spike protein, for example, the SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS spike protein, we can broaden the um, antibody reactivity against different spike, as well as elicit and boost um, original spike um, on SARS-CoV-2 spike specific antibodies. Um, and then internasal boosting is likely um, a very um, easy because all we need is a spray, a little spray bottle that people can administer into the nose without the need for health uh, healthcare um, professionals. Um, and because this spike is very stable, it probably doesn't require um, um, such a laborious um, sort of a chain of cold chain as well as distribution um, strategies. And so we believe that this is um, kind of a next generation vaccines that we need to pursue uh, this and other vaccine strategies that are creating nasal immune responses. So before I end, I wanted to kind of um, uh, mention that, you know, uh, we are um, still not equal with respect to the representation of women and people of color in STEM. And uh, this is a figure taken from a recent uh, review that uh, Yannick Valdez, uh, myself, uh, and um, Chanel wrote together to kind of uh, create a roadmap for what we can be doing to um, intervention really to achieve gender balance in the STEM field. Um, but there are many other uh, suggestions in that review uh, if you're interested in reading. And I think that this will only elevate the diversity and um, creativity of science in the world. So I'm gonna end by thanking all the members of my lab uh, who contributed to the work that I was able to share with you today, as well as the impact, uh, uh, impact Yale team, uh, without whom none of the uh, translational work could have been done. And a number of groups that we're currently collaborating to understand long COVID. Um, so I'm going to end here and take questions. Thank you very much, Akiko. That was an amazing uh, presentation. Lots of information there. Um, well, I'm going to take the liberty is, uh, of asking a number of questions uh, okay. as we'll come into the uh, into the Q and A. So one of the things I'm sure you, you you know I'm going to ask you is about this type one interferon response. So we're hearing over and over again, and there are reports in the literature of those who have any way a compromised type one interferon response um, actually tend to have a more severe outcome. Um, and yet your data suggests that, you know, over time, this interferon response is actually contributing to a severe disease. So the virus produces, encodes factors that block an interferon response. All, all this data is, is confusing. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of succinctly suggest mm -hmm. what's the chronology here and what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I should have um, explained that better. Um, so it, it is well known that genetic mutations in the interferon and interferon pathways uh, predispose people to severe and lethal COVID, um, as shown by uh, John Lauren Casanova and other groups. Um, and it's, it's very clear that early interferon is required to um, reduce the viral burden and recover from infection. And so that's really important. Um, and I think that's also happening to some extent in our severe COVID patients that early interferon is likely impaired in these patients. Uh, we are not able to catch that because people, when they got into the hospital, they already were in the mid phase of the infection. But we suspect that they also had impaired interferon early. And what we're seeing is the um, sort of long end of the sort of uh, what, uh, interferon response that once you fail to clear the interferon early, you have to engage other responses like the type two response or the type three response and, and sort of, you know, uh, maladaptive immune responses that are not really targeting the virus well, um, but are contributing to a lot of the pathology. And at the same time, we have this lingering interferon that's being elevated as a result of viral accumulation. And that is also contributing to the disease process itself. 
So I think not having the right amount of interferon early is an absolutely critical thing for developing worse disease. Um, but then, uh, you know, what we're seeing is the sort of other end of the spectrum where um, once you fail to clear the virus, then you, you sort of have this lingering amount of interferon that is contributing to pathology. That's what we think is going on, yeah. Thank you. And um, what do you think is the duration or the potential duration of this mucosal immunity that you have with a mucosal vaccine? Oh, right. So we are currently uh, looking at the long-term um, longevity of the uh, immune responses. And um, so after several weeks, we still see uh, very good levels of IgA against the spike protein in the nose. Um, we also see uh, tissue resin memory cells persisting. Uh, we're, we're extending it to much, much later time point, um, but it just takes time to, to get there. And my last question before I hand it off to the others is, so we, we've got in, certainly in Canada, four seasonal coronaviruses. Do you anticipate that that mucosal vaccine will also be effective against those as well? Uh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> So no, no, I'm not. I'm not joking. This, this, this. I think by just using different uh, types of spike uh, in the booster, um, we can actually uh, uh, increase the breadth, uh, as I was mentioning with SARS-CoV-1. But we can also include other types of uh, spike from the seasonal coronavirus to mm -hmm. uh, to really broaden <laughs> or even induce new ones. And because we all have some level of immune response to the seasonal coronavirus as well, so. Uh, yeah, we, we might be able to kind of like make, uh, you know, pan coronavirus vaccine one day. Great. So I'm going to hand it off to Payam, who has a question also. Thank you. That, that was a really fascinating talk. Uh, really appreciate it. Just a quick question from, uh, I come from a T-Rex background, so I want to ask something specific to that because uh, there have been papers, as you know, and it's a little puzzling that you see IL-10 as one of the key correlates with poor prognosis. So my personal way of thinking about this, looking at some papers from uh, Rudensky Group and also Hep Turnquist and some of the others, is what do you think about the sort of thinking that you have the classic IL-10 producing T-Rex and then you have the more tissue resident T-Rex, uh, you know, described by Diane Mathis and others uh, that are a little, little bit different in profile responding to things like IL-33 and producing uh, IL-13 and TH2 actually cytokines for tissue repair. Do you think actually that counterbalance in the tolerogenic cells, it's not that tolerogenic cells are bad, but that the imbalance within the subset could play a role in severity? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we only had access to the circulating population. Uh, so we can only speculate what might be going on in the lung, but um, well, yeah, we do think that uh, things like IL-10 and even IL-1 receptor antagonist that comes up during the infection that's correlating with uh, mortality, it's sort of a, a body's way of trying to regulate the response, but um, failing to do so. And they, they could be coming from Tregs or we don't know the source of IL-10 yet, but um, I feel like it, it's all this sort of part of this body's way to compensate for the lack of proper immune response and yet failing to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Eleanor, I can't hear you. In the interest of time, I think we're going to have to move on. Perhaps you can take a look in the Q&A and answer some of the questions there. Okay. Thank you for um, your support of uh, what's going on in Ukraine. I think this was echoed early by all of us at BSI Executive. We feel exactly the same. And um, just to mention that on March the 5th, we're going to have a, uh, a talk and a discussion on uh, equity, diversity and inclusion in academia and science. Um, just to your point. That this needs to be <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank, thank you very, you. very much. And um, yes, I'm you. now going to hand off to um, Leah, who's going to continue with the rest of this session.